Kansas passed a law requiring that 20% of all electricity come from renewables by 2020. Now, more than half the states in the country have similar laws. They're known as renewable energy standards. And it's thanks in part to these laws that in 2012, wind and solar in the U.S. grew faster than any other energy source, faster than coal or even natural gas. Kansas now has enough turbines to power nearly a million homes. And it's not just lefties who are happy about this. Kansas's Republican governor, one of the most conservative in the country, is a huge supporter. If we do this right, we will see the development of a renewable energy corridor throughout the state of Kansas that will provide jobs for rural Kansas and clean energy for the world. I want Kansas to not only be known as the wheat state, but also the renewable state, and we can do it. But not everyone is happy about all the growth in renewables. And some groups are working very hard to convince people that wind and solar are a bad bet. We are at the World Series of Poker in the Rio Hotel and Casino. Probably about 2,000 players, mostly poker professionals, few amateurs like myself. The game, it's so complex. There's patience, self-control, self-discipline. Then it's really important to be able to read people, understanding you know, who they are, how they're playing. And for my job uh, as an analyst for energy and environment issues and policy, like I would at the poker table, I need to know all the data, I need to know all the studies, I need to discern what each piece of data or study means fitted into the overall picture. The mere notion that climate is changing does not mean A, that we're facing a crisis, or B, that we need to do something about it. James Taylor spends much of his time on the road. Good morning. Going from state to state to state, trying to shut down any government efforts to promote renewables. I've been to most of the state capitals to meet with legislators or state officials or to testify. For today's hearings, would you prefer that I emphasize more the economics, more the environmental issues. Emphasize the economic side. I don't think okay. we're going to win the um, environmental argument. These are where the battles are fought regarding global warming and, and all sorts of other issues. The objective fact is that renewable power is substantially more expensive than conventional power. Natural gas, regarding the six principal pollutants tracked by EPA, natural gas cuts those pollutants by 90 plus percent. It's essentially an emissions-free power source. You are almost a wholly owned subsidiary of ExxonMobil, aren't you not? <laughs> well, that's what uh, the global warming alarmists the world would like you to believe. Taylor seems to be part of a vocal minority. I find a Gallup poll saying that three out of four Americans want the country to push harder on wind and solar. Why is Taylor so intent on stopping that? You'll win them back, don't worry. Trust me. Who is this guy? James Taylor is a senior fellow at the Heartland Institute, a libertarian think tank. They promote right-wing views on all kinds of issues, but what they're really famous for is denying man-made climate change. Right now, Taylor's focus is trying to repeal renewable energy laws all over the country. But how does someone like him influence legislation in dozens of states? I find out Taylor is working with a powerful group called the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. The name sounds dull, but ALEC's members have included some of the biggest fossil fuel companies in the world, as well as thousands of mostly Republican state legislators. Together, behind closed doors, they write bills that the legislators then take home to their individual states and try to get passed. Alec boasts that more than 100 of its bills become real laws every year. Arizona's harsh immigration law started its life as an Alec bill. So did the controversial Stand Your Ground law that was enacted in more than two dozen states. And we're going to the state capitol, please. And then there's the Electricity Freedom Act, co-written by James Taylor. It seeks to repeal renewable energy standards all over the country. Today, He's in Kansas. Many states are on the verge of rolling back the renewable power mandates. They're very close, especially since the fracking revolution, where we've been able to produce more natural gas. 
And oftentimes, when one state takes that first step, that enables others to follow. I think Kansas is going to be one of those states that is going to set the tone in the next few years. And with Heartland and Alec at his back, Taylor has direct access to lawmakers across the country. So uh, my friends, uh, Dennis Hedke and Forrest Knox here in the Kansas legislature, uh, we share ideas on a, on a frequent basis and we're meeting together to discuss those issues. Good to see you again. Dennis Hedke is the chairman of the House Energy and Environment Committee and a member of ALEC. He's trying to put a stop to Kansas's renewable energy mandate with a bill inspired by Taylor's Electricity Freedom Act. These renewable power mandates here in Kansas and elsewhere, they're requiring you to dismantle power plants that are in existence. Electricity demand, it's only growing at about 1% per year. So if you're to get to 20% by 2020, it means you have to take out existing perfectly good power facilities in order to build more of the wind and solar to make the 20%. A lot of folks really just can't handle the truth. That's the way it is, but we've got to try our best. That's yeah, a great point. Heartland introduces me to ideas and concepts that I wouldn't generate on my own. They have studied the issues in significant detail, and so they make recommendations to policymakers like myself. So that's the, the value to me, is it saves me time. Big savings of time. Anything I can do to help in terms of providing information or reaching out to people, just let me know. Happy to do it. Yeah. Thank you. As I investigate the future of wind and solar power in America, I'm realizing that many of the biggest decisions aren't made in Washington, D.C. They're made in state houses, like this one. This is where James Taylor has been focusing his energy, trying to convince local lawmakers that renewable energy is too expensive. Today, I'm meeting Kimberly Swati. She's a consultant for the wind industry here in Kansas, and she's been on the front lines of this local battle. So one of the biggest things that I hear is that if my state decides to switch to wind or solar, ultimately I'm gonna end up paying for it. My utility bill is gonna go through the roof. Is that true? We have seen in the last several years as the utilities have bought more renewable energy and they've integrated onto their system, the price impact has been de minimis is what they say. Zero to 1.7% impact. So not in Kansas, your rates will not go up in Kansas. It's no surprise that Swati would say good things about wind, but a report by the state of Kansas itself backs her up. And while it's true that in some states, renewable energy isn't as cheap as fossil fuels, prices are falling incredibly fast. Wind and solar dropped by more than 50% just between 2008 and 2012. And here in Kansas, Wind has also generated tens of millions of dollars for landowners, brought in billions in investment, and helped create over 12,000 jobs. The forces that are interested in pulling back are primarily external forces. And who are they? We've seen um, organizations um, like the Heartland Institute has come into Kansas and, and put out information that is um, misleading about uh, the cost of wind and renewables. And what is it that they're saying about the cost of renewable? They're saying that renewable energy costs a lot more than what it really does in Kansas. And I'm seventh generation Kansan, and, and this is a very important place for me. We have good things happening here right now. And it's very frustrating to see people come in and provide information that's not accurate for our state to try and undermine policies that have absolutely worked for our state. We'd like to present the facts on various topics, energy and the environment, budget and tax, to people who are influential. If you are a state legislator here in Colorado, or you have been a state legislator, could you just raise your hand or... Oh, there are a few more. It's our privilege to have with us in person the real James Taylor. Going to a Heartland event feels like entering an alternate universe. There are hundreds upon hundreds of peer-reviewed studies that show that humans are not causing, global warming is not causing an increase in extreme weather events. Don't let anybody tell you differently. In reality, the scientific consensus on climate change is effectively unanimous. It is extremely likely 
that humans are mostly to blame for temperatures that have been climbing now for decades. How sure are these scientists? They say about 95% certain. And in science, 95% is pretty darn certain. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, brings together thousands of scientists from more than 50 countries. Their latest report might be the most comprehensive scientific assessment in history, and its conclusions are dire. But to challenge the findings of the IPCC, Heartland and others set up their own group, the NIPCC. We are producing, look for it, the non-governmental international panel on climate change, the updated report, climate change reconsidered, explaining what's going on. Heartland even came up with a billboard campaign in 2012 over a busy Chicago highway that equated people who believe in global warming with terrorists. I'm starting to wonder, who's behind the Heartland Institute? So I'm heading to California to meet two people who have studied Heartland for years. I've come to California to meet with Lisa Graves, the executive director for the Center for Media and Democracy, and Brendan Demel, who runs an investigative website called DSmog Blog. They've made it their business to learn as much as possible about the Heartland Institute and other groups that deny climate change. Heartland has this storied history of attacking climate change. They've sort of molded their position to fit the times. You know, originally, they started out as outright deniers, saying it's not happening, it's a hoax. And when the science wasn't was clear, you know, they sort of shifted to, well, if it's happening, it's not that big of a deal, to actually, it might be good for us, it might be beneficial. And that's where James Taylor really, uh, you know, his position is that, that global warming will be beneficial for humans. The scientific evidence is really against them, but they say things so boldly and stridently that, that it makes some people believe that they must be telling the truth. So who are Heartland supporters? Where do they get their funding? Well, there's a number of things we know about the Heartland's funding and, and some that we don't, because as of 2007, they don't disclose their donors. One thing they do know is that Heartland is just a small part of a vast climate denial network with hundreds of millions of dollars behind it. Through a combination of public tax records and leaked internal documents, a lot of the money has been tracked back to two major sources. ExxonMobil, the world's largest oil company, gave at least $27.4 million to climate denial groups between 1998 and 2010, including hundreds of thousands of dollars to Heartland. And fossil fuel billionaires Charles and David Koch, who own Koch Industries, have funneled more than $72 million to the cause through a dizzying array of foundations and front groups. But recently, the money trail has gone cold. Uh, foundations or, or companies that gave money directly are now through this mechanism called Donors Trust and the Donors Capital Fund, able to shield their donors. Which makes it harder for the public to put pressure on those funders to, right. to not support. How do you hold well, someone accountable if you don't know who they are? Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund act as middlemen between wealthy donors and groups they want to secretly fund. The donors are able to remain anonymous. Much of Heartland's funding now comes from a single anonymous donor. And with the help of Donors Trust, more money is pouring into climate denial than ever before. A staggering $558 million just between 2003 and 2010. And Brendan and Lisa tell me that climate change isn't the only issue where Heartland has been on the wrong side of science. One of the things we've seen with Heartland and with the other groups is a real effort to muddy the waters, and that's right out of the tobacco company's uh, big PR playbook. In 1969, a tobacco executive wrote a memo in which he said that doubt is our product. If they were going to confuse the public, they needed to suggest to them that there's no link between tobacco and cancer. So we're going to sell this idea that there's confusion among scientists and continue to perpetuate doubt in the public mind and Heartland was one of the key players in that. In the 90s, with funding from Philip Morris, Heartland tried to discredit the science linking secondhand smoke to cancer. In a fundraising letter, Heartland's president boasted about how valuable the organization was to tobacco companies. And many of the same scientists now denying climate change got their start defending cigarettes. Brennan, can you tell us more about who James Taylor is? Sure, so James Taylor, his expertise is in the law. You know, he's a lawyer. He's a great talker. You know, he, he, he's a very personable guy. But uh, it's kind of shocking to me that anyone would rely on a lawyer to, to give them advice about science matters. You know, it's kind of like asking your dentist what to do about your heart condition. 
You know, he might have some interesting things to say about it, but he's probably not the specialist you should be listening to. Ever since I started following this battle over renewables, I've wanted to meet James Taylor face to face. I get my chance when he agrees to meet in New York. What is your point of view? Where do you stand on climate change? Well, we know that uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. If you add more to the atmosphere, you're going to get some global warming. So it's, you know, it's human nature to see change and fear change. But the best evidence out there, the best scientific evidence and data show that the moderate warming that is occurring is beneficial to human welfare, as it always has been throughout human history. Can you talk to me about who supports you and the Heartland Institute, who your funders are? Yeah, first of all, working on policy issues, um, I make it a point not to know. I don't want that to influence you know, what I write and think. And even if I wanted to know, the Heartland Institute prevents me from knowing it. You don't know who your funders are? I, I have a general idea of some, oftentimes because some global warming activists or people that don't like the Heartland Institute, they'll you know, assert that you know, we receive money from this group or that. In general terms, what I do know is that the vast majority of our funding comes from private individuals and from foundations. And if you look at corporations that have a stake in the energy debate, uh, especially fossil fuel companies, that, that would be a very small percentage. Why is this something worth fighting? Why is renewable energy bad? Yeah, people like to talk about carbon dioxide and global warming, but they don't talk about the 1.4 million birds and bats, including many endangered species, that are killed each year by wind turbines. Also, according to the wind energy industry itself, it requires 300 to 600 square miles of wind turbines to replace a single conventional power plant. Don't we need those things to help us jumpstart a new economy or a new solution to fighting a modern problem like climate change? Well, if global warming were a very serious problem, then certainly we would be uh, wise to look into that. But the science indicates that it's not a very serious problem. But James, I'm really confused because 97% of climate scientists say that it's real and that it's a problem and that it's man-made. And you, with all due respect, you're a lawyer, right? I'm a lawyer by training. I don't you're practice. a lawyer by training, but you're not a scientist by training. I'm a scientist by training as well. You're I mean, a scientist. I, I, I successfully completed Ivy League atmospheric science courses. So I'm a scientist by training. OK. Well, but let's get to your question. Well, well my question is that, that, that it, I'm confused, because there's over here kind of a mountain of evidence that suggests it's a problem, it's man-made, people will suffer. So why focus on, on the smaller evidence versus the mounting evidence. Well, I think your premise is wrong. In fact, more than 31,000 scientists signed on to a letter, a summary of the science, explaining why global warming is not a human-caused crisis. That letter you're talking about, is that that's the organ petition? Yes, indeed. I'd heard about this from Brendan and Lisa in LA. The organ petition. Right. It's one of the, you know, the original sort of efforts by the denial industry to suggest that they had thousands of scientists on their side that right. would say that global warming is not a problem. Right. But then as you look through those lists, there were fictitious names. Everyone from Star Wars characters to a member of the Spice Girls have shown up on that list. There certainly are some scientists. You know, they're meteorologists, they're geologists, they're biologists, you know, certainly people with expertise in their area, but they're far outside their specialization. Most of these people, they're not climate scientists. There was a name on it that was one of the Spice Girls. Who told you there that? Were names You're getting on bad it. information, there were names America. On it, like... if, you, if you look at the petition itself, if you contact the, uh, the scientists who put it together, they will present documentation. They have it on their website. More than 31,000 scientists have signed it, and it's documented. It's documented. <laughs> okay. After meeting James, I did some more research. His science training consists of a few undergraduate courses he took over 25 years ago. As for the organ petition, it turns out anyone with an undergraduate science degree can add their name. The website brags about the number of signatures, but less than 1% even claim to have an expertise in climate science. The whole thing seems kind of ridiculous to me. But with all the money pouring in, the denial campaign seems hard to counter. And I wonder how all this will play out in Kansas, where the vote on renewable energy is about to happen. In the end, despite the efforts of Heartland, ALEC, and others, not a single state voted to repeal its clean energy law in 2013. 
Instead, four states actually increase their goals for renewables. But Taylor is planning to continue the fight. I'm very optimistic. I'm very pleased with the way events have been unfolding in the states. Sure, I would like to have had some renewable power mandates rolled back by now. When I say by now, it's only been a couple of years that we've really turned the momentum. But I really think that, uh, that I have a strong hand in terms of what I'm advocating in the climate debate. And I, I'm, I'm very comfortable in my own skin in that debate, just like I am at the poker table.